we're realizing that symbiosis between human and machine is the way to go for the future. And welcome everyone to another episode of Slater Pod. Today we're super happy to have Marco Trombetti on the pod. Marco is, of course, the co-founder and CEO of Translated, the language AI agency based in the eternal city of Rome. Hi, Marco. Hi, Florian. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So are you in the internal city of Rome today? Yes, I do, as most of the time. I, I, I'm often in California, but I consider Rome my own. Where else could one be, right? Uh, I, I have to make it there in the next couple of years, definitely. So close. So uh, actually, pretty much two years ago, we had uh, your co-founder, Isabel Andrea, uh, on the pod. Uh, it was pod 52, one of our kind of earlier guest segments. So this has been exactly two years. So kind of tell us a bit about what's happened since and just kind of lay the land a bit about translated the story and just kind of update people on, on where you stand at the moment. Translated continued to grow. Uh, we were having a lot of fun with different projects. And uh, more and more, uh, we're realizing that symbiosis between human and machine is the way to go for the future. It's what we like to do more and where we're putting all our efforts for the future. So this part, we, uh, we arranged, because there's a super interesting piece of research that you guys uh, published uh, just very, very recently. And so if I may, I, I'll, let me start with a quote from the article that you, you uploaded to the website. So very interesting. It says, language translation was one of the first challenges taken on by researchers in the domain of artificial intelligence. It remains one of the most complex and difficult problems for a machine to perform at the level of a human. Now, if I understand this correctly, this is part of a research project you named Singularity in AI, and it was part of your recent keynote at the, uh, I think, AMTA conference in Orlando, right, where you quantified progress towards Singularity in AI through data that highlighted quality improvements in MT. So, Marco, tell us more about this Singularity research project, scope, key parameters, assumptions, et cetera. Yeah, first... Everybody, everyone today is talking about general artificial intelligence. And every single week you find the news about something new created that, that is making progress in AI. But, but, you know, for many years we've been working on that and, and nobody knows really when, when this is coming. Okay, so we, we took some of the data that we have that I'll tell you in a second to try to predict the speed in which we're approaching singularity. In general, not just in the language, but trying to predict, thanks to the data coming from our industry, that is one of the industry that adopted AI before anyone else. Okay. Most of the AI models they use today were invented for machine translation. So because we are pioneers as an industry, uh, we use this data to try to predict how quickly we're, go we're getting into uh, the singularity. And so this is the study about the speed for the approach, and so trying to predict the little progress. Because every single day, we know that MT is getting a little better, AI is getting a little better, but how much and how far we are from reaching the goal of having something that is as good as a human. Singularity is kind of a, um, it's a tricky concept, right? I mean, I know it in the, uh, in the realm of like Ray, uh, Ray Kurzweil and like basically just the machines completely taking over and, you know, the world basically being run by AI. How, how would you define a bit more narrowly singularity in translation? Yeah, so in translation, uh, we define singularity, uh, the simple version, the one that is easy to communicate to for everyone, is that when a professional human translator will take less time in editing and machine translation than editing another translation by, done by another professional translator. Got it. That's pretty clear. Okay. So when we reach that point where for me it's more convenient to use the output of a machine rather than the output of a colleague in order to do a review to, to create a final translation, perfect, then this is where we say singularity. Then the more complex formulation that we use internally translated to be able to measure the progress and not trick ourselves so that we, we have a solution, we say that... It, uh, is a translation whose quality is is basically is produces a quality with less than five error minor error per thousand words, which is the equivalent of a translation done by a pro and a review actually <clears throat> that is delivered in less than five hundred milliseconds 
and the cost less than 1,000 times less than human translation. So you really need to achieve a quality level measured in minor error per thousand word, standard uh, metrics. Uh, it needs to be fast, 500 milliseconds, and needs to cost 1,000 times less. Why? Because even today, we could create a much, much larger model than what we use. It would cost 10,000 times more than, you know, 10 times more than human translation. It would be very good, and in some use cases will be better than a human, but is inapplicable. Who will pay for a machine that costs 10 times a human? So <clears throat> the easy way, as I said, is that it would be more convenient for me to edit a, mach a machine translation than a human, simple. And then the complex one is less than five error per thousand words, 500 milliseconds, uh, cost less than 10,000, 1,000 times less than the human. With the 1,000 times less, would that apply pretty much to all machine translation? Or I don't have to figure this in my head. If it's like a custom model that somebody had to kind of build a bit, would that still fall below that? Or Today, when you have like machine translation at, at tens of dollars per, per megabyte and human translation at 10, 20 cents per word, that if you do the math, that is about 1,000 times, 1,000, 10,000 times. So keeping that ratio... If you have the ratio, really nobody will care about the cost. People will be able to translate a thousand times more given the budget that they have. And now, of course, you guys have run this piece of research on an enormous amount of data and experience. Can you just tell us more about like what, you know, obviously we translated and make cat, you have so much data and so much kind of life data, real life data, not theoretical academic data, right? Yeah, so j just to connect the dots, we started uh, doing um, machine translation was started in, in 2002, okay? With rule-based system as a, a project sponsored by the AU with Cistron, rule-based system. And then we switched to statistical machine translation, did other research, and in 2010, uh, we released, we started a project called MateCat. That was the first web-based CAT tool that was integrating adaptive machine translation. So statistical, it was at the time non-neural, but it was learning from user correction, okay? By creating MakeIt, basically for uh, uh, now 12, 13 years, we have been collecting uh, what we were suggesting to a human in terms of machine translation and what the user, the final translator was, was really uh, delivering and the amount of time it took to the human, to the translator, to do that. Both the first uh, pass, but also every single edit the time was increased by the amount of time spent on the second. So we collected what is called a time to edit. And so we, we have about 100,000 translators that participated to this over 12 years. And really the data is, 90% of the data is generated by 10,000 people. But still, this is a very large amount of people, very diverse. They represent many different humans, many different contexts, many different domains. And so we think this is the most representative sample ever created of the industry because it's very diverse. And it's not only customer of translator because we have provided MateCat for free to many uh, professional translators that are using it every day. So they use it and basically they share with us the corrections. So we give them the technology, they tell us basically where the machine was wrong and we improve the adaptive model. That's the principle. By doing that, we collected 12 years of time to edit data so that we could predict every single day what is the, the amount of edit a translator need. And, uh, and if you will look at the research, basically we went from 4.55 seconds per word in, or in 2007 and it started getting down, down, down. Now we are about at two seconds per word. Um, so really... People in uh, just in the last um, uh, seven, eight years already doubled uh, the amount of words that they're leaving per hour. People need to look at the chart. I'm just looking at it here. Yeah, you see how it's going down, like from three to two, and then obviously you're kind of pulling it further down towards the one, right? Uh, very interesting chart. A little, a little bit of ups and downs, but the downtrend is definitely uh, perceptible. And so, in fact, that is the feeling we have every single day. You, you have the uh, the, the change is so small that every single day, maybe you don't perceive it, but when you look at them in month by month time, uh, then you really see this small progress. And when you sum up the progress in 10 years, that is impressive. And I think that this is the first time ever in the field of artificial intelligence 
that someone did a prediction of the speed to singularity. So Ray Kurzweil, you mentioned, uh, used a very different approach. He was saying, look, in order to achieve general artificial intelligence, you will need this level of capacity of computation, this level of data, this level of learning, algo. And, and really, what we're saying here, okay, we don't know what is needed. This is what, what is happening. This is the speed in which we're approaching singularity. I mean, it does speak to the fact that we, as you said, were, as an industry, a pioneer in adopting this technology. I mean, it kind of became only very obvious, as, at least to me, over the past couple of years, as a lot of other use cases and applications kind of start to come online. It's like, well, we've kind of been doing this for a long time already, right? Yeah. You you mentioned time to edit as kind of the key, um, key metric here. And can you just unpack it a bit more and also maybe distinguish it from other things like, you know, edit distance or even the, you know, the, the blue metric that some people hate to love, love to hate. Blue score is an edit distance. And so the, what happened at the beginning of machine translation is that you, you, you're not able to measure the time that people are spending and you're doing research in labs. So what people initially did is that they say, okay, I know for this content, I, this sentence, I know what the correct translation is. It's called a reference. And so I ask the machine translation to translate it. And then I measure what is the difference in terms of characters based on a reference. So the more the translation looks different in terms of characters, the more bad the translation is. So the closer it is, the better it is. So this worked great at a distance, worked great at the beginning when the translation was so bad the really the output was so different that you could measure by characters difference or word difference, you could measure really the, the difference. What happened, the now translation are so good, the blue score that do not really is not, does not have a resolution good enough to be able to distinguish between the further improvements that we do. If we do a new model and we try to predict if this is better by blue, blue sometimes will say it's worse, it's bad, the, uh, better. The only thing we can use today is either time to edit, so really you measure if this is helping translators, if you want, so the cognitive effort to go to perfect, or you do something called an A-B test. So you provide two translations, uh, the old one and the new one, and you ask people to say which one is better. So blue is slowly becoming not a good metric, and A-B test with human evaluations and even complex human evaluation uh, is becoming better. And, and for, for some use cases, uh, where you really are in production scenario, well, time to edit is the final metric, is, is the metric, because it is the real measure of the cognitive effort. And to give an example, we may have two sentences that, are, uh, that do not require any kind of edit. They're good. They're acceptable translation, but one will require the translator a lot of time to be approved because it's awkward in the way it's written. And, and it's a good translation, but it's, it's not fluid. And the other one is fluid, easy to understand, easy to read. Time to edit is able to measure the difference. No other metric will ever be. So, and also sometimes you need to change it out just one character and it takes a lot of cognitive effort to really understand that, that sentence and, and, and change. The change is not a measure of, the, of how wrong the translation is. It was just an approximation that we use it in the early times. Our industry is based on a cost per word. So if you think at the end, what you want to minimize is the time that it takes to do translation. That makes a lot of sense. And of course, also this, the, the framework you're building here eventually will help uh, move towards like an hourly based uh, or just a different type of pricing model as well for, for the entire industry eventually. Potentially. At the end, we still use a word based on level. It's just the the... Uh, we discount words in different ways based on the effective time. Uh, something uh, that translator always did is that this time, for example, if translator will spend 50% less time than with no MT, then we basically pay them 25% more per hour. So we don't pay them 50% less words. We, maybe we discount only 25. So really they earn 25 more percent per hour, which is a good way of splitting the benefit and making sure that the best translator will will join us to, to do the work. Now, would you 
agree that we kind of are starting to reach that, uh, what I guess Gardner would call the plateau of productivity kind of in post editing now, or like how far you, I mean, in your chart, there's still a bit of ways to go down, right? But like, do you feel that we're at that plateau and like, are there any easy, quick wins left in the supply chain for post-editing or or not really? Because we are now six years into this. Honestly, so I have seen many people talking about the plateau, but we don't see it. We, we see that we still have uh, the room for doubling the productivity in the next uh, five years or so. And we are at two seconds per word and, and we can go to one. And where we think the singularity will come one, why one per second is one per second is, is that if I take a perfect translation that does not require any kind of edit and I ask a translator to, 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 to approve it, it's taking about one second per word, 10, sentence, 10, 10 seconds for a word. So when we reach that point, then we reach what we defined before the, the singularity. And so, so but still, we, we can double the productivity in the next year. So, and every year we, we still see an improvement. So I, I think there's, a lot of work to do, and then we reach the singularity, and then everything changes, because uh, uh, the, the 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 way I think a lot more content will be translated automatically, and a lot of more, and so I think that we will go from human first, and then eventually MT to MT everything, and then asynchronously translators that will help the machine to improve. Probably bigger industry, more work translated, but. Um, uh, different approach in, in the work. It will be so fascinating to see once, yeah, the cost comes down to a level where it becomes like the natural thing to do. Of course you have this piece of content in 30 languages. Why not, right? Why wouldn't you? And then you got to differentiate yourself with some added layer of um, language quality or whatever it is on top of it, right? Um, one problem, I guess, that some people have, many people have, uh, is still kind of the user interface and the kind of the interactivity problem when it comes to interacting with machine translation. What are your thoughts on this and what are you guys building? What do you see? It's a very good question. Is the hardest problem we have. So building user experience, interaction design uh, uh, in, in many other fields is relatively easy uh, because it's, it's new stuff and you have to train the users basically to interact with something. Because if you think about a car, we learn how to use the wheel, the brake, acceleration, and, and the pilots or, or a piano player, and, and also user interface like search or other tools they use in your computer, the mouse, the keyboard. So these are mechanical things outside us that we need to interact with. But here we're discussing about the user interface for interacting with natural language, the most human thing we have. So uh, there was a lot of progress and I, I think there was a different approaches. You know, the company uh, named Lilt uh, created a very nice interactive way to, to basically propose machine translation to translators. And so they get suggestions and then they, they write, predicts, and then you, you basically complete or accept a lot of interruptions for the human, mm -hmm. but also you feel very in control. So it was easy to adopt. Uh, we use other approaches like um, and reusing the, the interaction that there was with translation memories. And so the machine translation comes and empty as a TM suggestion. And so really you just need to edit what is wrong and then, and then you, you go in that way. But this was relatively easy and it was done during the last 10 years. Now think about this. Two seconds per word means 20 seconds per sentence. So now we need to be able to allow people to change the style of a sentence, uh, many other things that are more complex. And we have to interrupt them to provide that, that suggestions and that input, but we only have 20 seconds. In 20 seconds, they have to understand what the source sentence is. They have to read the suggestions, they have to approve the suggestions, and then we need to provide an extra suggestions incremental is very difficult because every single thing we have there is slowing down people more than what we have. So we are in a point where improving the user interaction in, in machine translation is very complex, but there is so much potential in, in now using uh, very large language models to help people to write more fluidly and better, and we need to invent solutions. So it's hard, but kind of we need to. 
And also just from a cognitive load, I guess, right? I mean, just clean up the interface and make it like very unclutter it, I guess, right? Remove anything. Not everything. <laughs> so the thing that powers it uh, is, of course, machine translation and Translate it now owns um, modern MT. And so why do you think it's important for a large uh, language service and tech provider like yourself to kind of own that part of the stack? To be Precise. So we 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 were the founders of Modern MT anyway. So we always wanted a big stake for Modern MT, and then we had our research partner also in the company. So we acquired 100 percent, but mo we always considered Modern MT as as our baby. So we always an important asset. Now it's becoming more and more important every day, because we think we can only reach the singularity through this symbiosis between humans and machines, and so. Um, St uh, standard machine translation solutions are not designed for professional use. They are not designed for our industry. So if you think Google Translate, beautiful translator, but this is designed for general public. So you need a technology that you can control, you can change. So we needed to have context adaptation. We need to have user adaptation. So as the translator fix the errors, you want to improve the model in real time. You don't want the translator to correct again and again the same errors in the document. That needs to happen now. You cannot wait six months for every training. So uh, you 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 need to create much larger models in some use cases because the, you can pay more while you are translating. Uh, you, we can use very large models to just improve the quality a little bit because cost of MT while professionally translated is irrelevant. And also, we also needed very low cost. Uh, machine translation models that the market does not offer because when Airbnb wants to translate uh, 700 million reviews, you cannot use what is in the market there. So, so really, you need to own it if, you, if you're serious about translation and, and, and really you want to reach the, the singularity. And, and human and machine, we can no longer improve the quality of MT using data that's in the web. We reach the plateau there. So, we need to own it. We need to get the user feedback, improve the models, and, and work with the best translators in the world to improve the MT. And, and so really, this is something that we couldn't find from, from, from the markets. I mean, the, the people were great models, but interested in, in other problems. Let's talk a bit about the business side of Translated. So just tell us some, like, what are some of the key client segments? And I understand you're working with some of the world's biggest companies like Airbnb, Google, Expedia. Like, how, how do you serve these big enterprise accounts? And just give us a bit more color to that. I think Translated, what it does is always, you know, this, this symbiosis. So uh, I, I, I think the best example, so, and, and some of the largest tech companies work with us, okay, on, on, on these things. Um, and uh, and some of the top AI companies in the world also uh, that are doing great things these days um, are our customer. But the the approach is that we come with a solution, Translation OS, where we we provide human translation with great the best translators in the world. And while they're working, really, we are training an AI model for the customer. So think about Airbnb first year. We take their production, switch it completely to this new model, single vendor model. So we provide a platform, they connect the content. The human translators are translating. While they're translating, they're receiving feedback from Modern MT. They fix the errors. At the end of year number one, uh, Airbnb had a model that was outperforming Google Translate nine times out of 10. It was perfectly trained on their own domain without an extra cost because they were simply doing the translation. So they take that content and because it was so good, that is something that I think was the first time ever done in the industry. They made the translation the default. So they pre-translated every single piece of content they had. So all the reviews, 700 million in 62 languages, all the listings, 7 million listings in 62 languages, all the chat between the users and the global customer support massive amount of content, they indexed it and they made it the default. If you go on Airbnb, you don't see a button now with translate this page. You see the translation by default and you click the button to see the original. And that at this scale, I think it was the first time ever. And this was possible because of the symbiosis between human and machine. Humans are translating now 1% of the content of Airbnb. But 
actually big amount of volume and one of the largest contract in the in the industry, probably the largest. But still, to that, they were able to translate something that was impossible to translate, would cost billions to translate from humans, 300 man years, we estimated. And now, so they're pre-translating everything. So this is the way we go to customers, is this symbiosis of humans and machine, humans that train, adapt, train a model that then is used to translate the UGC. Now, about a year ago, I think Translated secured like a major growth uh, equity investment from an investment firm called Ardian. Like, what did they see in the industry? What did they, what attracted them to to invest in, in Translate, but of course in the industry also at large? They must see uh, this as a, a positive case, of course. Well, I, I think that they, they saw also what we, so first, we don't celebrate financing round because we consider financing round as the compromise that is required to achieve goal is not a measure of success. The measure of success that Ardian, which is the fourth largest fund in the world, number one in Europe, is, is joining us on the mission to allow everyone to understand. So we love the idea that there is someone else that shared the vision. And, and really the vision is that translation will play a much more important role in the future. As we are approaching singularity, all of us would like our content that we write in social media to be available to all the world. And that will happen because my content will be translated and by understood by everyone. Uh, because messaging, communication, uh, everything will have a much more profound use of translation. And so we think that this industry is going to grow significantly and uh, will be a lot of changes also, and, and, and really, it's a big opportunity. And uh, even recently, you know, um, one of our competitors that you've seen, DeepL, they made a, a round of investments, and they are in a market worth 250 million, and I think they got something around a billion dollar evaluation. So they got an evaluation of a single company, which is four times the size of the machine translation market. So either all investors are wrong, or there is a beautiful future for the translation industry in the future. Yeah, I agree. I think, I'm not sure if it's even confirmed there, right? It's still like, I think they might still uh, sign the, the share purchase agreement, but uh, it's probably gonna, it's probably gonna come through with DeepL. Um, now over the past week, uh, we all of course watched ChatGPT uh, come online and play it around. I'm not sure if you have. Well, I lost. I have, and we, <laughs> we put a little, uh, kind of a fun video up where we uh, we ha kind of pretend made it pretend to be a translation manager and had a, a, a synthesia avatar speak it and created like a five minute podcast. Anyway, that that was our little contribution there. What are your thoughts on this? Like uh, so far, playful or like massive change or every single month it get more useful from playful to useful every single month. Okay, and so uh, the GP three model has been. It's been there since a while and is always improving. And now this is really the, is what is called the struct model that has been uh, retrained with 33,000 um, sentences with request and generation done by humans and they've been fine-tuned on a chat to answer it, to answer it. And in fact, if you use it, you see certain patterns, okay? I'm not sure I can understand, I can answer this perfectly, but I think no, they have a certain structure that is learned by those examples. Uh, what I think is, is wonderful, I think big language models will be the future of search. So I think that Google should wake up because in the future, uh, yeah. I think the big language models will replace what we have in search. I don't know when, but this is, is going to happen. And, uh, and also I think we should be extremely proud in our industry of that result. Because GTP stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Transformer was invented for machine translation. It's the technology behind modern MT. So, GP, so Chat GPT is a $1.3 billion billion parameters model uh, reduction. This still a version of the laptop one. Modern MT is a 16 billion parameters model. So we're using exactly the same technology. And now what we have been using for many years, not just us, I mean, even the full industry, is becoming the state of the art of general artificial intelligence. That, that is a great news. And again, no, show that translation is a pioneer in AI. And, and 
second good news is that natural language is becoming the interface. And so if companies like OpenAI succeed in replacing Google for search, and natural language becomes the primary way of interacting, well, I think our industry has got a lot of a lot of opportunities in the future. So both from an opportunity standpoint and also proudness, ego, I think uh, is chat GPT is, is a great uh, thing. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of businesses people are building on top of this now. I think it's still a little early and I'm sure they're going to release it in different iterations, but I'm, I'm seeing like some very initial things on Twitter that people are building like little apps and stuff on top that uh, could be useful. Think about the trends. Advertising is going down, okay? Subscriptions are going up. So if you want to guess, people will buy five euro a month, a new tool that will answer solutions for them, okay? So it's, it's relatively easy to predict that will be not something advertising-based, will be subscription-based. And second, uh, today, um, people that do advertisement you know, will want to drive their business in other ways. And so if advertising is less effective and crowded, um, why not building an, an ecosystem of APIs around very large language models? And so next time you say, hey, I would like to buy this iPhone and I would like that to be delivered to my house. And so maybe Apple will not create a beautiful website only, but will create a set of APIs for language models for them to interact. And so customers, uh, so big producers will and webs whatever producer website now will basically create create a new layer of interaction with those. I've seen also work preliminary work in interacting with websites directly. So even if you don't build the API for your website, well, you can use a generative models in order to navigate a website. So the first one will create an API. The others maybe the model will be able to browse and click and buy for you. Uh, one of the company that, you know, uh, translated also as a venture fund called by Campus. And one of the company we invested in, Mondadio, was doing this four years ago, was was really buying flight ticket. And so you you basically were telling what you want, like Uber, you were clicking to buy. And then there was a bot that was going to the Lufthansa website, buying the ticket for you and sending you the boarding pass. So all these things were possible four years ago. I think now... It's much easier. So I, I do see how this replaced search and the new ecosystem that is coming. And it's just a guess, an educated guess by based on what's happening. Uh, but I think it's plausible. For search, it's interesting. I mean, maybe not for like deep search or whatever, when you really need an authoritative um, kind of source, but like for just general, quick, easy questions, like why not? I mean, like, I guess 80% of my Google searches would be kind of, could be addressable by something like chat GPT. Yeah, you mentioned something. Uh, source of truth. You need a reference. But you know, the, re the biggest difference between the standard GPT and chat GPT is exactly that they added confidence into the model. Now the model is able, when, when it's not sure, is able to say, look, I cannot answer this. Okay? And it's, it's a very light form of confidence. It's not valid. But I don't think it's hard to be able for the model to explain how he came up to a certain conclusion. And I think that summarization of the reference may be more efficient than me reading 10 papers, 10 references, and coming to the conclusion. Maybe GPT will be able to summarize the why of a certain thing in a way that is faster for me to understand. So I think trust and reference is something that can be solved soon. Fascinating. I mean, we could just go down the rabbit hole here, but... Uh... Let me ask you another question. You mentioned uh, that the company that's buying tickets online was part of a, your Pi campus. So you run this one, you run Translated, you do the T Ocean Race 2023 and the Imminent Research Center. Tell us more about some of these initiatives and how do you find time to do all of them? Well, I find the time I don't know. That's, that's, I'm, I have to think about this, this one. But um, uh, uh, I think these old things there has got something in common, and it looks like very, very different things, but they all share one vision is that, so we, we strongly, even if we do technology, we do AI, we strongly believe in humans. Okay. And so really we are all these activities because the boat, for example, and around the world regatta, 
to to share our values around the world. The 50th anniversary of the, one of the most adventurous regatta. I have never been on a sailboat before, so it's not my passion sailing. But but by doing that, when we do innovation, we need to get into contact with customers, partners, employees, people that are brave. If you want to do innovation, you want a certain kind of people. The boat was the biggest and most successful recruiting uh, platform we ever had. In San Francisco, uh, we started saying, okay, we're going around the world. We need 20 non-professionals to join. We yeah. advertise it in our industry. 400 yeah. people in our industry are quite 400. 270 people. Many of them, I think, that they're listening to us and they say, hey, brave people, joined and started the training for the Ocean Globe Race. So some of them came one, once, and then they say, okay, this is too much. Some people came again, again, and I know for sure, and I will not tell the name until the end, that we have some people in industry that are going on a leg of the race, okay? And some other, one, um, decided that he's organizing the parties <laughs> between <laughs> <laughs> the legs of the regatta. But it's, uh, yeah. it's um, I think it was... Um, it's a great way to, to find brave people, people that believe in the future, that are willing to overcome problems for a better future. And those kind of people is the one that you need in order to, you know, to plan and, and create a wonderful future. So the investment fund, same thing. 60 investment, we do invest in people with great ideas. And we took 5 million from Translated, we created that fund, and then it became an evergreen. Some of the company passed at a billion dollar evaluation, uh, the some exits, and so that created a new object that where we there is about six thousand people now that that work in companies that we funded. So we it's a great way to spread uh, our values and and create a community um, around those values. Yeah, and you're you know still at the helm of the the language services and technology provided despite all these different initiatives that's uh says a lot about also how uh kind of fascinating and interesting this piece of business still remains generally and i guess to you personally my passion is language so all these other things are instrument to achieve the goals but the uh, looking for the singularity in language translation allowing everyone to understand that me understood the their own language I, I don't think there is something more impactful that I can, I can work on. And sometimes we joke here in the company, we say Elon Musk is working on the front problem. Because, you know, they're trying to go to Mars, thinking that making life uh, multiplanetary is the most important problem. No, I think that what we're working on in this industry is the most important problem. If we allow people to understand each other, they can cooperate, and then they can design, design that future. So we are the tool for the cooperation and creating those things. No climate change if we don't understand each other. No interplanetary uh, humanity if we don't understand each other. So I, I think this is a wonderful place to work. I, I love what I do and I, I, I don't get distracted with the other things. Got it. Well, Marco, that was a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Florian.